Good afternoon and welcome to Orkney International Science Festival 2021 online and this year of Scotland's coasts and waters. My name is Julie Rich and it's my pleasure to be hosting this session from sunny Orkney. This lecture is in association with the Northern Periphery Programme Sci Tour Project and it's my dream someday to get over to Greenland and our speaker Liz Cooper is going to take us on a short tour of Kuyata and Esaviswit Nipissat, two UNESCO World Heritage Sites with lush subartatic farming, ancient hunting landscapes used by both Inuit and Norse cultures. Liz Cooper from Visit Greenland and Copenhagen Business School has researched sustainable tourism and tourist behaviour in Greenland and is part of the Sci Tour Wonder Seekers Development Project. I'm delighted to hand over to Liz with our lecture, Greenland of Norse and Inuit. Thanks, Julie. And thanks for your perfect pronunciation of the names of the heritage sites, which you only just learned, so well done. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you. I hope that works. Okay. So yeah, hi everyone, and um, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It was very dramatic opening music, so I hope I can live up to your expectations with this session. Um, I'm Liz Cooper. I'm going to talk to you about two of Greenland's UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Um, I have been invited to talk in association with a development project, which is called CITOR, or also known as Wonder Seekers, which is funded by the EU's Northern Periphery and Arctic program. Um, I do have a bit of a cold, so sorry if I sound a bit sniffly, um, or if you see me wiping my nose. Good thing about online festivals, I guess, is you're not gonna catch whatever it is that I've got, which isn't Corona. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk about for about uh, 30 minutes. There's gonna be some videos, so it's not just gonna be my sniffly voice the whole time. Um, and let's get started. Okay, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm an industrial PhD candidate based at Copenhagen Business School in Denmark. Uh, my PhD is sponsored by Visit Greenland, which is Greenland's national destination marketing and managing organization. And uh, my everyday research or my PhD research focuses on tourist behavior and trying to find ways to get tourists to Greenland to behave more sustainably. Um, I'm also kind of a part-time research assistant on this project, uh, which I previously mentioned called Site or, or Wonder Seekers. Um, there was a lunchtime session today, I believe, which focused on the project itself. So hopefully some of you managed to see that and you know a bit about the project already. But I'm just going to briefly tell you a bit about the project. So it's a development project funded by the Northern Periphery and Arctic Program, which is an EU fund. Um, and the aim of it is to help small tourism businesses to extend their market reach by developing a new tourism concept with science and scientific knowledge at its heart. There are four country partners in the project, Greenland, Iceland, Finland, and Scotland. And the main partner in Greenland is, is actually the Greenland National Museum and Hans Hansen, who is the heritage resource manager there. Um, Hans is currently somewhere out in the wilderness on fieldwork, uh, which is why he unfortunately can't be here today. And um, which is why I'm telling you about Greenland's UNESCO sites. Um, okay, so let's start with some basic information about Greenland, because it tends to be one of these remote places that nobody really knows much about but it's super interesting. Um, maybe some of you know the story about how Greenland got, its, got the name Greenland when Eric the Red sailed there and tried to name it 
favorably to try and encourage his fellow Norsemen to come and settle there. But this is only the European name for Greenland. Um, its original name is Kalashet Nunat, which means the land of the people in Greenlandic. So Greenland is located way up north, kind of between the Arctic and the Atlantic oceans. Uh, most of it lies above the Arctic Circle. The Arctic Circle isn't actually marked on this map, but it kind of skins the top of Iceland. So if you imagine where that would take you if you followed it round, then you can see just how much of Greenland actually lies above the Arctic Circle. Um, Greenland is an autonomous territory within the Kingdom of Denmark. So this means that it used to be under colonial rule by Denmark. In 1979, it was granted home rule, which meant that it gained control of some of its internal affairs. And in 2009, it was granted self-rule, which means that it has control of all political affairs except for foreign affairs and defence. Um, and Greenland does still receive an annual block grant from Denmark. Uh, so the entire population of Greenland is only 56,000 people. It's the least densely populated place in the world. And what I think is super interesting about this is that 88% of the population are indigenous Inuit. And you don't often see an indigenous majority in colonized or post-colonized nations. Um, and most of the rest of the population are Danes. There's a small minority of people from other parts of the world as well. The capital city of Greenland is Nuuk, uh, which has around 17,000 inhabitants. Um, actually, Nuuk was recently, in the last few days, named the world's first sustainable capital city. So that's a huge achievement for them. Um, and all the other towns and settlements in Greenland are much smaller than Nuuk. So, for example, the second biggest town is about 5,000 people. The third biggest town is about 3,000 people. 80% um, of the surface of Greenland is covered in ice. And this is the famous Greenland ice cap, which is one of only two polar ice caps in the world, the other one being on Antarctica. And actually the landscape in Greenland is so rugged and huge that the towns are not even connected by roads. So if you want to move between towns, you have to, you have to fly or take a boat. And this inaccessibility is one of the things that makes Greenland a place for the most adventurous tourists. So even pre-COVID on a global scale, our tourist arrivals were quite low, at about 100,000 tourists per year. Um, and surprisingly, the corona crisis brought tourism in Greenland basically to a standstill as the country closed its borders to any arrivals which were absolutely necessary. And nowadays fully vaccinated tourists can enter again, but it's going to take a while for, um, for the tourism industry to, to get back to what it was before. Okay, so let's move on to uh, UNESCO, which is why we're here. Greenland has three UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Um, the first one to be inscribed was Ilulissat Ice Fjord, the, the northernmost one that you can see on that map. Uh, this got UNESCO status in 2004. And Ilulissat Ice Fjord is the channel through which ice that comes off of Ilulissat Glacier reaches the sea. Ilulissat Glacier is one of the most active and fastest moving glaciers in the world sometimes argued to be the fastest moving glacier in the world, although I think there's one on Antarctica, which is competition. Um, and this glacier has been studied by scientists for 250 years and has been massively helpful in helping us to understand climate change. It's actually said that the iceberg, the iceberg that sank the Titanic came from this glacier. Um, the second site, to be inscribed as UNESCO as Kuyata in South Greenland. Um, this got UNESCO status in 2017. It's actually a collection of sites around South Greenland, all of which have significance for farming cultures, both Norse farming and Inuit farming. And the third and newest site is Asavisuid Nipisset, 
in the middle there, West Greenland on the Arctic Circle. It was inscribed in 2018. Um, and this site encompasses a huge area that stretches from the ice cap all the way to the sea, and which has been an Inuit hunting ground for at least 4,200 years. I'm going to talk in detail about the two most recent sites. Uh, so that's Azovisvidnipasep and Pieta, um, because they're both in earlier stages of development. And they actually complement each other in terms of the different but similar types of land use that's going on there. But first, I have a video that I want to show you that kind of shortly introduces the first two of, of Greenland's UNESCO sites. It was actually made before Azovisvidnipasep was inscribed. So that one doesn't feature, but it, I just wanted to show you it because it gives you an idea of the size and the magnificence of the landscapes that we're dealing with in Greenland. Um, I hope that the quality is fine because I'm gonna stream it from my computer. Thank you. 
All right, yeah. Greenland is so photogenic that I could probably just play you videos for an hour and it would be better than me talking. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's just uh, an example of, of two of the landscapes here that have been UNESCO inscribed. Um, okay, so now we're gonna move on to talk in a bit more detail about the South Greenland site, Priyata. Um, now South Greenland is described as the lushest and most fertile part of the country. And when, when I say lush and fertile, we're talking average temperatures of around eight degrees Celsius in the summer and about minus five in the winter. But, so it's a matter of perspective. But South Greenland is home to Greenland's only forest. So it's very possible to grow things here. Um, and as a result, the area has been home to a strong farming culture for over 1000 years. So this is a map, a more detailed zoomed in map of the five main sites that make up Kuyata UNESCO World Heritage Site. And this is where Eric the Red and the Norsemen landed in the 10th century. It was their main settlement and they established several farms here. So the five main sites of the UNESCO site represent the most rich examples of their farming culture. Many ruins of the farms still stand and can be visited, but many of them have actually also been revived by modern Greenlanders to work as fully functioning farms. So what's really fascinating about this site is the meeting of different cultures and their connection with the same land and using the land in the same way, um, but being centuries apart. And this is why Kuyata is known as a cultural landscape. We don't really have a video yet which focuses specifically on the UNESCO sites in South Greenland, but I wanted to show you a video of one of the fjords in the area, the Samut Fjord. This fjord is actually located just off the bottom of this map that you can see now. So it's not technically part of the UNESCO site, um, but it does give you an idea of the kind of landscapes in the area. This, we've listened to you. Ranging from 22 liters when compressed to 40 liters when expanded.
yeah, so that was just a little taster of that area. Um, now we are going to move on to the other site that I want to talk about, as Vissa would never said. Here you can see where it's located in Greenland, West Greenland, and it lies right on the Arctic Circle, covering a huge area which stretches from the inland ice all the way to the sea. This site is also recognized as a cultural landscape, but the land has historically been used in a different way. Um, this is a more detailed map of the site. Um, and this area is actually the largest ice-free landscape in Greenland. And this is why throughout history, it's been used as a valuable hunting ground for many different groups of settlers and is still used as a hunting ground today. Humans have actually been hunting here for more than 4,200 years. It's pretty crazy. Um, and there are some really good video resources about this site, actually. So I want to show you a couple of short videos which will present the site a bit better than I can. I think um, the links to the videos will go on the event page as well. So if you want to watch them again or in better quality, later than they will be there. Um, but the first video I'm going to show you is a general introduction to the site. The second one focuses on hunting in the area. The first video is also pretty cool because it's in Greenlandic, so it gives you an opportunity to hear the language. There are, of course, English subtitles, so you know what's going on. Um, but yeah, let's go with this one. Nunasuang <laughs> as you wish to eat the Casa Tigina, the Gutacosuti said, the Sakari suit, Sulita Gusaput, Xeni Amma, Nuna Manetaman. As you wish to arm in and this Immanelanian is on the swam in a flitting amateurly, the Gusuti Seni Barato also. Then I'm Tana Nang Lagisen Ushumikut, Nuna Adoctana or Galati, Ukiuni Fiatos in Torono in Dushli, Suli Adorati was all on a meet. Okay, and um, yeah, and this next one is uh, a really cool little video which describes how ancient people used to hunt in one of the areas of, of Asvisvud. Um, this one is in Danish with English subtitles, of course.
Ransdyrjagten her på bogpladsen, den foregik øh, om efteråret, når ransdyrene i hundredvis eller tusindvis trækker fra det dybe indland og ud mod kysten. Så kommer flokkene forbi her ved Asavisuit Dasiat, og man har bygget varter af sten, sådan så at man hele tiden fra flere kilometers afstand trykker, lige så forsigtigt trykker de trækkende rensdyr ud mod bogpladsen og får rensdyrene samlet på et mindre og mindre område. Og til allersidst her i terrænet omkring selve bogpladsen, der har man så skydeskud bygget af sten, små halvmåneformede anlæg, hvor bueskytter kunne ligge og gemme sig. Og så det folk gør, når rensdyrflokken kommer trækkende, det er, at de begynder at vifte med armene og måske øh, lave lidt lyd, sådan så rensdyrene bliver presset længere og længere frem mod bueskytterne, og til sidst så kommer rensdyrene så tæt på, så de bueskytter, der står gemt bag øh, store sten og bag buske og bag øh, skydeskjul, at de kan komme på skudhold af rensdyrene. Andre rensdyr vil trække forbi her, hvor vi er lige nu, og ud på en lille pønt i søen og forsøge at svømme over søen, og der har man så haft øh, fanger i kajakker, som kunne øh, øh, sejle efter rensdyrene og, øh, og fange dem med lanser. Yeah, I just think it's super cool to learn about how people used to hunt and also to think about how long this has been going on and people have been people are using similar methods today. Um, so yeah, I want to talk about the two sites in combination shortly. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the challenges um, related to development of these sites and then a bit about tourism. Um, so yeah, thinking about these two sites together, one of them is a farming landscape, one of them is a hunting landscape, but they're similar in, in the sense that they both demonstrate a similar use of the land across huge amounts of time and across different groups of people. So in the south, this picture is from South Greenland. Um, in the south, the landscape's been used to farm in two very different periods of time. The Norsemen farmed mainly cows. Um, today's Greenlandic farmers farm mainly sheep. So you can get, you can actually get locally farmed lamb in South Greenland. Um, in Asavis with um, the land people moved with the seasons rather than establishing firm settlements like they did in South. But people today are still using the same hunting grounds as their ancestors did thousands of years before. And the stories behind these cultural landscapes are a huge part of what, what gives them their outstanding universal value as UNESCO World Heritage Sites today. Um, this is just a cute little Arctic hare in Asavisavid Nipasad. And that is a statue of Leif Eriksson, who was a son of Eric the Red, um, which stands above Kasias, one of the uh, one of the sites of Guyata in South Greenland. Okay. So now to touch on some of the challenges that are being experienced in the development of these World Heritage Sites. The first one is human resources. There's a lot of development work to be done, simply not enough people to do it. And when you're working with such huge sites, especially in the case of Asavis with Nipasa, Um, this can be a challenge, especially with the increase in tourism numbers that can occur as a result of properties receiving a UNESCO World Heritage status. Climate change is, of course, a constant and increasing challenge for Greenland in general. Um, Greenland is getting warmer and the landscape is changing. And climate change doesn't just have an impact on the landscape, but on how people use the landscape as well. So, for example, we're already seeing hunting patterns changing quite drastically 
in the north of Greenland, where reduced amounts of sea ice in the winter mean that hunters simply can't get to the same areas to hunt. So it will be interesting to see how climate changes change the use of the landscape in these two UNESCO areas, if they do. Of course, many people are optimistic that the warmer climate will allow for more things to be farmed and grown. So there will inevitably be impacts on the farming culture as well as the hunting culture. And then finally, tourism. So yeah, being inscribed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site brings exposure to the areas and an increase in the number of visitors. In recent years, well before COVID struck, we did see an increase in tourism to these areas, especially cruise tourists. And this potentially brings more litter, more waste, manipulation of archaeological features, erosion of archaeological features, especially if there aren't established paths or there isn't enough signage or there isn't enough infrastructure. So it is important that we try to develop the sites in sync with the amount of visitors. But again, this goes back to the human resources issue. Do we have enough staff to get the sites ready in time? Um, okay, so yes, this brings me nicely to focus on tourism and to connect to my uh, to the Saito Wonder Seekers project, which is the reason I was invited here. There are, of course, a lot of positives to UNESCO inscription. And one of, one of them is that it hugely raises international awareness of the sites and encourages people to visit. And this in turn creates an urgency to protect the sites uh, and to introduce measures like signage and infrastructure and the things which preserve them. Um, in Greenland's tourism industry, we are strong believers that tourism done responsibly is positive. And in many ways, these sites can actually be more vulnerable if they're not inscribed as UNESCO World Heritage, because then there isn't necessarily the obligation to protect them. So yeah, how does this link to the development of scientific tourism in Greenland? Well, one of the central ideas behind the site or Wonder Seeks project is that scientific tourism is the kind of tourism that's beneficial and responsible. We're still working on, on defining exactly what scientific tourism is in Greenland. But we, we really want to take departure in local indigenous knowledge and try to kind of level the playing field in terms of what constitutes scientific knowledge. So that traditional ecological knowledge, which is deep knowledge of a place which is discovered over very long periods of time by people who've lived there and adapted to living there, can gain legitimacy in mainstream science. And this is where these two UNESCO World Heritage Sites actually fit perfectly in and can be a real opportunity because they're so rich with traditional ecological knowledge. They've been used by different groups of people for so long and the knowledge of how to hunt and farm in them has been passed down through so many generations. So they're a great example of this kind of knowledge. Um, yes, I think that is about it. And we have plenty of time left so I can answer all your questions. Um, I've put there some links uh, for further reading in case you want to read more about the Wonder Seekers project or in case you want to read more about Greenland's UNESCO sites um, and how they're being preserved and also my email address and the email address of Hans Hamsen, who is the Heritage Resources Manager at the Greenland National Museum, in case you want to get in touch with us for anything. I guess I'll stop sharing now. Well, thank you, Liz. Um, wow, what a, what a feast for the eyes. Um, what an incredible place. Um, and um, we in Orkney, we do have our own UNESCO um, heritage site um, in the Hartney, Lithic Orkney, and you know for um, for different reasons, people are coming here for archaeology. But um, we are on the the cruise liner circuit, um, and before COVID, it was very busy. In fact, I think next year we've got about two hundred liners um, booked to visit. So um, wow. we can quite understand, you know, the, the problems around managing sustainable tourism. So we've got some questions here from folk. 
um, lots of questions. Um, if I can go back to the capital city of Nuuk, um, what did it do to become the world's first sustainable capital and how was it achieved? Yeah, um, yeah, good question. Um, so uh, it's certified, there's loads of different ways to be certified in, in being sustainable, but it's been certified by a company called EarthCheck, which has a lot of different requirements, um, such as how you manage waste, recycling, um, power, green space, social issues. Um, and they've been monitored. I think they've been undergoing this process for quite a few years and they have to input data on all of these statistics. And then when you reach a certain threshold, you're certified. Um, so yeah, it's, um, I think you can probably just Google earth check and check what the requirements are, but um, it's a lot of different things and it's, and it spans all kinds of sustainability. And it's not that Nuke is scores perfectly on everything, but some of the stats are, are quite interesting if you look at them in a Greenlandic context. So for example, the green space one, Nuke absolutely excelled on because in terms of ratio of like residential area to wilderness area, there's so much wilderness. Um, so yeah, I think it's quite interesting to look at um, to look at how what makes Greenland an interesting place in terms of how it like really excelled in some some of these statistics just because of geographical features, like how much pure wilderness there is. Yes, and, and I think um, that might be good examples for you know for other areas to to follow. Yeah. Sure. Well, you, must be doing, you must be doing a good job because I've got somebody from South Greenland called Sarah Woodall and says, good job, Liz. Oh, thanks, Sarah. Thanks for watching. <laughs> um, and there's quite a few um, questions about um, sustainability, um, particularly around the, the hunting area. Um, yeah. Obviously, if, if they've been um, hunting and they are still hunting, you know, for over 4,000 years, they must be doing it in a sustainable way. So first of all, um, how did the caribou get there and are they managed? How did they get there? Yeah, that one, <laughs> that one I don't know the answer to. I guess they walked over from somewhere else in the Arctic at some point. Um, uh, oh, about the sustainably managing them, yeah. Yeah, nowadays there are hunting coaches. Um, um, but I guess they weren't back then. But um, I think caribou or reindeer in particular, there there's so many of them that that it's quite easily to sustainably manage that population. But in terms of like um, other hunted animals like uh, polar bear and uh, narwhal and whales, there's very very strict quotas on them because they're. Uh, obviously more under threat than the caribou. Okay. But yeah, all of the animal populations are sustainably managed. That's great. And um, because they're doing such a good job of that area, um, um, somebody's asking, would it be better to um, ask the hunters, you know, what's the best way to, you know, to make the tourism sustainable? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, um, and the people who work on these sites are, are in constant dialogue with them. Um, hunting in Greenland is not like, so there's not like the hunters and then the people who are not hunter, hunters. So most people in Greenland hunt, it's still a very normal part of everyday life. People who work in offices will take a week off in hunting season and just go hunting. So it's kind of, that tradition is integrated into everyday life um, quite strongly. So, so it's always easy to get input from people who hunt. And is that something that um, tourists can do as well? 
Um, it's possible. You have to, there's certain guidelines that you have to follow and, and you have to obviously go with a licensed company, but it's possible, yeah. Okay, it's good to know. And then um, Les um, has said, um, would it be better to preserve these places by not visiting them? Yeah, that's a very good question. And it's kind of one of these ongoing um, questions in tourism. One of the eternal problems, I guess. Is it better to just leave places alone? Um, yeah, it's. I guess it depends what you understand by preservation and what are the benefits that can be achieved by allowing people to visit like can people bring benefits can people put money into the local community can people contribute to regeneration of of places um and i think it's everything is very context specific and you have to look at the cases and say okay how is tourism working in this place what are the benefits coming in how can we control it and manage it to ensure that the benefits outweigh the costs. And just simple things like you, of course, you can preserve a site and still have people come. You just have to manage the flow of people. Um, but yeah, it's a very interesting conversation. <laughs> yeah. And I think I think we could go on forever. I know it's difficult getting that balance. Yeah. So that's where your, your research will come in uh, will come in useful, you know, um, because you know things don't never stay the same. So you know you might have to um... exactly. And and when you talk about sustainable tourism, it's like, of course, you can question whether tourism can ever be sustainable, but it's not sustainable in the sense that everything is going to stay the same forever. Things are going to change, but but can we direct the change in a positive way? And that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, that's good. And um, I've got um, a question from Pia, um, who's one, one of our speakers um, at, the, at the festival here. Um, she's asking, is there a cap to the number of tourists visiting the UNESCO sites? There isn't at the moment. Um, but it's obviously, yeah, it might happen. I think they're undergoing these um, vulnerability assessments at the moment, which is where th there's hundreds of different categories and they're assessed like kind of how vulnerable they are. And, and I think it's, there will be conversations about carrying capacity and should we cap numbers and things like that. But yeah, it's, it's in the early stages at the moment. I've got an interesting comment here from Alistair and McDonald. Um, and he says um, the pharaohs had an interesting scheme where they closed the islands for maintenance but offered incentives for tourists um, as to act as volunteers to repair paths you know, volunteerists if you like Yeah, that was a really cool campaign um, I say campaign, it wasn't just a campaign but it was partly a campaign um, Yeah, it was a really good idea um, uh, could we do that in Greenland? Um, yeah, I suppose we could. It's just Greenland is so huge. Like I still can't even get my head around how how huge it is. Um, it's just a massive, massive job, um, and we're getting there. But I think I think. Things like that, like the Faroe Islands closed for maintenance, is really inspiring in the sense that it shows you that there are tourists out there who really do want to help. They don't just want to come and consume the destination, but they want to give something back. Um, so that's nice. Oh, that was good. I, mean, I know um, just before COVID, there was, a, I think, one of the two buses from the liners. I, I saw them down in the local beach and they were doing a beach clean you know so I thought that was quite nice that they did a beach clean you know so they were you know interested in doing something to help the area as well as you know visiting so yeah for sure it'd be good if there's more of that kind of thing um, yeah and I was also asking about the recession of the ice cap um 
is, is it evident because of global warming? And if so, what are the consequences arising from this and these sites and other parts of Greenland? Yeah, um, yeah, it's a huge question. I guess no one, nobody really knows the consequences. Um, but I think, yeah, I don't know. It's not that like, when you look really far into the future, there's a lot of people who've done kind of like projections of what will Arctic tourism look like when the ice is gone. And then it's, it's not like there's gonna be no tourism. It's just like, there's not gonna be ice anymore. Um, but that's really far into the future. But, um, but yeah, I don't know. I think it's all we can do is kind of speculate at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. And I'm, I'm given the sort of high percentage of indigenous people um, still in Greenland, um, how much do you consult um, with them, um, you know, with, with the UNESCO heritage sites and, you know, the tourism? And is there a, a chance that by expanding the tourism that it's going to have a, an effect on their, you know, their numbers? Yeah, I mean, I guess one of the really good things about having a majority of, of Inuit people is that they are involved in the tourism industry. Um, you know, they are more often than not the people making decisions. So, um, so hopefully it will be easy to kind of direct it in a way that's sensitive to, to the indigenous people because because they're quite often in control anyway. I think that's one of the really interesting things about Greenland, like not just in terms of tourism, but, but generally, um, that there is this high population of indigenous people and, and it's not like that in, in so many other post-colonial nations or colonial nations. Is it something that that, that um, is uh, visit Greenland are doing is to sort of promote more sort of cultural um, tours um, for people, you know, to learn from the indigenous people, um, you know, their practices, how they lived, and and how they live now as well. Um, can you have that alongside the scientific tours? Yeah, of course. And, and as I kind of touched on at the end, like we we think the two are integrated. It's not like you do a scientific tour or you do a traditional cultural tour. Like the traditional culture is, is part of the scientific knowledge that we want to convey to people who come to Greenland. Um, so yeah, definitely local knowledge, traditional knowledge has always been a big focus for us. And, um, and I think it will only increase. That's great. And then, um because of COVID and people not being able to travel as well. I've got a, a question here from Madges and he says, excellent talk, Liz. Um, he wonders um, if there's any particular opportunities to make digital tourism a source of data about the visitor's behaviour and the way to nudge people to visit or not sustainably. Um, yeah, make digital tourism a source of data. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Um, but yeah, uh, depends what you mean by digital tourism. Can he write again? <laughs> and do you mean people visiting online or do you mean people using digital devices while they are physically visiting. That's yeah, my he question. Just, he says it's more kind of to get an understanding as to what people want, you know, so that what are people either online or, or, or through an app, you know, what, what kind of things are they okay. looking at? Um, you know, what's, what's the demand, if you like? Okay. Um, yes, for sure. For sure, that would be great if we could do that. Um, we just don't have the resources to do that at the moment, but it would be great. If you want to do it for us, then get in touch. And what's the, what's the next part of your, your research? 
that you're doing? Um, um, what your next stage is? I am, um, well, my, uh, my plan has kind of been quite severely affected by the corona crisis. Um, but the original plan was to um, conduct some kind of behavioral field experiments with tourists in Greenland. So I would set up some kind of small changes to the natural environment. Like for example, if they're visiting a heritage site or something, change the signs in some way, or maybe introduce some kind of um, app or something to see if it will change and then sort of measure the effect on tourist behavior. So it is kind of, it could be nudging in the sense that you want to influence people's behavior without negatively impacting their experience and without them really even noticing, like making the sustainable choice the easy one or the default one. Um, but in, you see it already a lot in hotels, like with things like if you want your towel changed, put it on the floor or like default, not, not cleaning your room by default. They have to request for your room to be clean. But trying to, to test some of these strategies like kind of in the field, which is a lot more difficult, like out in on site in destinations when people are wandering around. Um, that's the sort of thing I would like to test hopefully next summer when, when tourists come back. Um, yeah. And I certainly hope we get, they get that opportunity to do so. Thanks. We'll see how it goes. Um, and because um, um, a lot of your videos they are in Greenland, I um, look like they were maybe in the summertime. Um, is, can you still have tourism in Greenland over the winter? Yeah, you definitely can. Um, the tourist numbers are much fewer, obviously. But, um, but yeah. You can fly there, you can travel around, you should pack your thermals because it's going to get cold, but you can go dog sledding, you can see northern lights. Um, it's really, really beautiful in the winter. Is that something that you think you would promote to, to try and, you know, to keep people away from that sort of summer, you know, and a sort of hot spot time, if you like, to try and promote a different time when people should visit? Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of the things that um, Visit Greenland actually is focusing on, kind of season expansion to spread tourists um, throughout the year a bit more. Um, but yeah, it needs, it takes time, obviously, but that would be, that's the dream. <laughs> well, it's certainly my dream to get there. I go as far as Iceland and I would love to um, just get that little bit further and get over to Greenland um, and, and visit. Um, yeah, do it. You're welcome anytime. And um, so what um, what uh, markets are you looking at for, for these, um, these um, side tours that you're going to do? Yeah, um, that's a good question because I think it depends on, because we're four destinations, I think it depends quite a lot on the different destinations. Um, but I know our top markets are Western Europe, North America. Um, so, so that's what we'd be going for. I mean, I think the, the project itself is too kind of short term to be, to be breaking into new markets, but, but it is also the, the markets that fit with the scientific tourism concept, kind of reasonably wealthy, well-educated. So, so I think it's a really good fit, actually. And I don't know what the top markets are for the other destinations, but I imagine it's, there's a lot of overlap. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's just a, a stepping stone, I suppose, um, and it'll only um, hopefully expand a bit from there. Um, and thank you very much again, Liz, and, you know, I wish you well with your research. Thank you. Um, and hope that things start to get a, have a recovery and get back to some kind of normality for you um, for next year. 
And thank you to all our viewers. Um, your feedback's much appreciated. So if you've got time, please um, fill out the feedback form in the description. And our next talk is at five o'clock, um, Move It Into The Sun, a demonstration and talk by Matt Sillers on the early photographic process of cyanotype. So I'd love to see you there. And if you're enjoying the festival, um, please donate and um, the full details are below. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And for more exciting chat, um, do join us in the Festival Club at half past nine. We'd love to see you there and hopefully we'll have some of our speakers from today. So um, that's goodbye from me and thank you all again. <laughs>